how they feel. I don't know. I don't really know what to say, but it's not a kind of thing that is good. And those girls will have gone through a lot. I feel bad because I'm also a girl and they are my mates. Now if I was kidnapped like them, I wouldn't be very happy because I will see some of my mates going to school and I will not go to school. For what? I want government to bring back the girls because some of them will be presidents, governors, people that will make this country a great nation. So I'm pleading for the governors to bring back our, bring back our girls. This country is no longer safe for we girls because most girls are suffering under this Boko Haram um, situation. Mom even warned me about strangers. If they like ask for help, I shouldn't answer them. So since then I've been scared. Anyone that wants to ask me of any help or something, I'll just snub the person because of the kidnapping of the girls. The dramatic manner in which the students were abducted have been variously narrated in the media by a few lucky SKP. A report by the global human rights agency Amnesty International revealed that the Nigerian Hami had four hours notice of the attack but did little to prevent it. An indictment that has since been refuted by the military. So why was the attack and subsequent abduction of the girls such an easy run for the insurgents? Does the Nigerian army and other security agencies have the logistical capacity and intelligence to truly combat this chameleonic and brutish organ Boko Haram? Security challenges that have cropped up in this country in the last one or two years have exposed the security forces as a body that is lacking in finance. That is not just lacking in finance, also lacking in hierarchy, lacking in organization. To deal with this type of security challenges that have cropped up, for avoidance of doubt, the Nigerian security forces, if you, if, if you like, the Nigerian army, the Nigerian navy, the Nigerian police, the Nigerian air force, without being a modest, just fought one civil war. And from fighting of that Nigerian civil war from 1967 to 1970, they were just sitting down in the offices. No actual security challenges cropped up any longer until what we now find ourselves. So there is need, from what I'm saying and telling you now, for a general reorientation of the Nigerian security forces to be able to deal with this type of challenge that has cropped up. The problem is not with the level of the training of our men. Our men are well trained. But the question is, do they get the right equipment? Do, do, do they get the right motivation? Do they get the right direction? Those are the basic problems, which looks very, very disturbing. The military are there, you know, they are combatants, period of war. They come to, you know, to action. But you see, we are facing a peculiar war. These are people you can't identify. These are people that are imaginary. These are people that you cannot say this is where they are coming from, this is where they are going. You know, they study the situation, they strike. This so-called Bono, they have detailed so many military there, so many, all these police uh, mobile force and so on. You know, but the situation is that, what can you do in a situation where even the so-called Insurgents have the backing of the military in a way. But there was an attack that happened recently, and one of the members of these insurgents was apprehended to be one of the serving uh, uh, military personnel in Nigeria. Here, you know, somebody saw him, apprehended him, and identified him as a, a member of the, of the armed forces of Nigeria, working for the opposition, working for the insurgents. So the problem is this. It is not easy because they have insiders. They have those people who are supplying them with ammunition, supplying them with information, supplying them with whatever they need. So if the Nigerian army has decided that, okay, these people, they have security intelligence report that they are going to strike in uh, Adamawa, somewhere a village in Adamawa tomorrow. One of the military men and officers will leak the report to them, and they will try that, that effort. They will change their striking point. 
So that is the problem. The military itself, how are we sure? How are we sure that there is unity? How are we sure that we can you know, rely on them for any effective performance? Because it has already, you know, it, it has already been, they, 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 have, they have entered, they have penetrated the military and you cannot be too sure of anything again. And that is the problem. It's not as if the military is really weak, but the military in this sense is incapacitated. While the quest to free the Chibok girls has gripped global attention, the terrorists have continued their campaign of bloodshed. Two other bombing incidents occurred in Yanya, a suburb of Abuja. I was coming from the other end, heading to the time because I live in Kadua instead. And then after, this, after the bridge, I was looking at this side, reminiscing of what happened at that time, not knowing that the same thing will happen immediately. In fact, as, as I just, my motor just was here, I just had one before I knew it. All of my, all of, all of my, all of my body, I could see blood everywhere. Everything, my motor shattered, all the door closed, nowhere to go out. So, luckily for me, one of the glass, uh, glass were open. Please, I jumped out, out of the motor. I had to jump out of the motor, looking at my head everywhere, Lord. I ran and called for help. They came to me, used a uh, cloth to cover my head, lay me on the ground. They called the police. Unless they go with poli uh, bless Nigerian police, they try so much. The police and the DSS say they have made significant progress in their investigation. And this was further buttressed with the parade of five persons arrested in connection with the incident. The long arm of the law appears to have caught up with some of the culprits involved in the attack. The five persons are Ahmed Rufai Abubakar, Muhammad Serni Ishak, Yehu Seidu, Adamu Yusuf, Anas Isa. In the morning of 14th April 2014, Rufai Abubakar Siga moved the explosive laden vehicle to the position where he detonated the explosives. Mohammed Sani Ishak, who took part with Rufai Abubakar Siga in positioning the explosive laden vehicles that exploded at the Nyanya Park. Two others were declared wanted Abubakar Siga and Aminu Sadiq Oguchi, a British citizen and Nigerian Hami Disata. Oguche was said to have been earlier arrested by the DSS but was eventually released following pressure by the human rights community on the supposed violation of Oguche fundamental rights. This spotlights once again the contentious issue of arrest and detention of suspected terrorists. If Oguche was indeed arrested and subsequently released, the sum of 25 million naira is hereby announced as reward for anybody with useful information on their whereabouts. However, news updates indicate that Oguche has since been apprehended in Sudan. What transpired in the case of Ahmed Rufai Abubakar appears even more confounding. Is this suspect the same individual arrested by security forces three years ago in Meduguri? Or is he a look-alike? In 2011, crime fighters interviewed this suspect along with others earlier arrested and paraded by the police. Is it the same man? Uh, even from Anuit going upside down, doing things badly, like going with stones, storing there, burning there and there. So if we get any abuse by any person or government, so we use writing or preaching to attack that. So from that effort, I think Mama Yusuf raised his alarm just to be different. Was he released without prosecution? Questions and more questions. The abductions has drawn international outrage. US First Lady Michelle Obama said 
The mass kidnap of school girls is part of a wider threat and intimidation facing girls around the world. Noting that she and her husband were outraged and heartbroken over the abduction of the girls. Celebrities across the globe have lent their voices to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. From music star Sean Combs, aka Puff Daddy, to movie star and UN ambassador Angelina Jolie, to former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Malala Yousafzai, have expressed solidarity with the Nigerian girls abducted. Equally, the United States, France, UK, Canada, China and Israel have joined in the rescue mission. But what are the wider implications and could this be the tipping point in the battle against terrorism? If we could have done without that, for a sovereign nation as Nigeria, it would have been better. And there are other problems that can uh, arise from it. So, because by doing that, we're submitting our sovereignty to these people. And Nigeria, the big giant of Africa, yes. we go out to help rescue others. We go out for foreign missions. So, for us not to have been able to uh, protect ourselves here is a problem. And I don't think it's lack of uh, experts in this country. I think the government does not maybe want to use the experts they have in this country. They would rather use the foreign experts. But by so doing, it creates a problem because you expose your uh, territorial integrity to these people. They get to know everything. Anything they haven't already uh, gotten through their satellite imagery, they're going to get everything. And watch it. With time, they'll start determining who rules this country. But right now, since they've taken so much time in rescuing these girls, they need the international assistance. Why would I say that? Because at this time, we cannot guarantee that these children are still within our borders. If they had moved swiftly, then they would have gotten them while they were within our borders. But at this time, since there's a possibility that the children could be moved to other foreign countries because of our porous borders, we have to work with the international community just because we have taken so much time. Their intervention is a very welcome development. I think they are here to actually give intelligence. They are here to give support, at least to rescue these children that we're talking about. So it's a welcome development. Going by the way the Chibok issue started and is unraveling, it seems that our military is incapable of handling the situation. Or there may be an issue, really serious wrong with our military. Okay? So for them to come ahead, it's a work on development. All we want is our children, we want our daughters back in whatever form, whatever format. After that, we will not discuss whether the military aid is necessary or not necessary. But if there's anything anybody can do to help bring the children back, let us bring the children back first. Because I, for one, I don't support American aid anywhere. It has never worked anywhere. Libya is still on fire today. Iraq is still on fire today. Sudan is still on fire today. I've never seen where America went and they came back successfully. Afghanistan is still on fire today. Ukraine is joining them too. They are all helping them. So you see, their help is always, I always look at it with a pinch of salt. It's not something that I cherish all that because they have their own interests to protect. And you know, Nigeria has the largest economy in Africa today. So I want the government to be watchful. It denigrates our sovereignty. Nigeria is a sovereign state. And when you are a sovereign, it is believed that you can do whatever you want to do by yourself. You are not a colony. You have gained independence. You believe that you are capable of maintaining the security and protecting the citizens in that country. And hence, I think their assistants are welcomed. Members of the United Nations, which Nigeria is an active member, are coming out to collaborate with Nigerian government to ensure that that situation is arrested that uh, the tourists are checked. I know those are the efforts being made.
The terror group has released videos online calling on governments to engage in a prisoner swap. Should the Nigerian government batter the prisoners for the girls? I don't think the federal government should negotiate because the prisoners you want for exchange are people who has been unleashing mayhem on the populace. You now release them again and will still be in the same danger. So the federal government in alliance with other foreign nations should do everything possible to rescue the girls unconditionally. Well, I wouldn't say how we have to negotiate with an illegality. They are in perpetuating a crime. They are the ones that have committed a crime and they ought to face the music. Then the issue of exchange does not arise in this circumstance. There's nothing to exchange for. Or what is important, the people that have been brought to come and help Nigerian soldiers to deal with the situation on ground should swim into action. So that's what I'm saying. As the world prays and waits for the successful rescue of the girls and reuniting them with their families, governments must begin to also consider what steps it must take towards helping them to overcome the traumatic experience. No doubt the war on terror has taken its toll on the country and it is non-negotiable that Nigeria wins the fight. But perhaps victory transcends a military upset over the enemy. To vanquish Boko Haram may require much more than a military victory. The nation must reflect and engage in a soul search towards understanding how and where it has missed its steps and what must be done to build a peaceful and secure future for the country. All said and done, what the Nigerian child has to say is We bring back our girls! Crime Fighters, the number one security program on television.
crime fighter. The searchlight on crime and criminality. Fighters promoting security. Thursday, after 33 years of meritorious service in the police force, it was a interview. Sir, we are glad to have you on Crime Fighters. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Plateau State has its own fair share of uh, communal and ethnic clashes. How has the police in this state been able to contain this? clashes. Uh, we've had history of clashes here and there, ethnocentric clashes, crime religious crisis, crime political upheavals, and so on and so forth. Has had its own fair share, even of students, students' crisis also, and so on and so forth. But um, thank God, with um, synergy between the command currently being run by me, since I came on board, I've had good synergy with sister security agencies, including the State Tax Force, the National Civil Defense Corps, Immigrations, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, and the Directorate of State Services. We have a very strong synergy, and we have what we call the Joint Security Committee meeting regularly to share experience and share intelligence. And by so doing, we're able to network, to be able to reach out to the hinterland in particular, where we're having these clashes. And um, we have also used um, the very, very robust uh, instrument of dialogue because we have seen historically, right from the First World War to all the wars that have been fought, even before the First World Wars of the 18th, 19th, 20th century, we discovered that dialogue is central to um, settling these um, crises out of the war theater. So we have used dialogue, and dialogue has uh, paid off. And even as you came now, you met the Deputy Inspector General of Police. Operations, uh, Michael Zokuma, FWC on ground, our uh, assistant inspector general police on force, so, and myself putting heads together with the Fulani Ardos, the Biron chiefs, the chiefs of um, the Tarox, and all the tribes. Because this place, the melting culture of all tribes coming together, including the Bo leaders, Yoruba leaders, Isoko leaders, Robo leaders, Ijo leaders, all of them talk with them on the issue of peace and maintenance of security which is a collective responsibility that has helped immensely to curb the upsurge of violence that is I want to beat my chest and say yes, we've been able to get the members of the public to join us in the fight against crime and criminality. One, two, we've been able to reduce um, crimes of violence within the metro. When you come to the metro, you see the modicum of peace that is, um, you can enjoy. If you look out, you see the peace pervading the area. Is a result of the combination of material, manpower, logistics, interaction with members of the public, sharing intelligence to make sure that what happens in the land does not find its way into the metro. So one of the achievements is that we've been able to record a very low crime rate in the metro. The crime rate of uh, car theft was what I met when I came on board. Able to checkmate. A lot of them are in prison now, and a lot of them are undergoing psycho, emotional. Um, treatment through the infusion of um, psychologists in the prisons, talking to them and also we persuading them while in prison not to come, come out again and become what we call criminal recidivist. A recidivist is a man that out of crime cannot survive. So he comes out of the prison and goes back to crime. So we'll be able to check with that. So the crime rate of theft of vehicles were packed, carjacking has been reduced to the barest minimum. Then we have this uh, upsurge in pedophilia, where people are making love to juveniles, defiling them, both the male and the female, and able to arrest most of them, expose them and their antics, and most of them have run aground. So we look at armed robbery, murder, culpable homicide. The, we have been able to sensitize the traditional rulers, the religious leaders, the youth leaders, to be able to talk to all their youth, control anger. Anger management is key to the crime of passion. A little anger arising from misgiving or a little uh, altercation leads to another one picking up a dagger and stabbing the other to death. So the religious leaders are up to the task. The traditional leaders are doing their best to manage the anger of the populace. So that's one area also. 
Then generally, because of my background as a former commissioner of police, anti-bomb, I've been able to talk to them about the issue of bombings and the philosophy of self-control during the occasion of our explosion. So, and I want to use this opportunity also to tell the people, in the event of explosion, do not be quick to stand up and begin to run. Why explosions get dangerous is that the shrapnels travel a bit above the ground level and anybody that is running or anybody that is observing will fall as a result of one observation two running from the scene of explosion. What to do is really there's explosion, you keep lying down, at least observe 20 minutes on the floor there because the terrorists will explode and that first explosion is a come along call. What I mean by come along is that a lot of people will rush to the scene to see what has happened and in the process they will deteriorate us and that one. So the level of carnage will be very expansive, robust in this content and that the terrorists want. So when there's an event of explosion, skip lying down, 20 minutes, the strapless travel and then everything is calm, you cannot get up and begin to help those who are involved in uh, injury, death, move, remove the death aside, injured aside, begin to ferry them straight to nearest hospital. So that's what we're trying to do now to National Union of Road Transport Workers, to the student community, secondary student community, tertiary student community, market women. To be able to cover all that and to expand and direct as the case may be that every motor park must have a barrier, a metal barrier, and each motor park must have inspection mirrors to check under the need underneath of their vehicles and then must have body scanners to check for metal arms and so on. So those are the things we are doing now and part of our achievements. But the greatest achievement is um, being able to mobilize public to see something and say something. That is where we are airing in the whole country. People don't know it is their responsibility to see any unscrupulous element moving around and call the nearest police station, call the nearest security agent and draw attention. If you go to the central society, that's what they do. See something, say something. So those are the issues and part and parcel of our achievements. It's uh, twice monthly, we hold Pali. In fact, um, we had already put in place a structure that is um, out of ordinary as the police traditional relationship committee that has to do with only relationship between the police hierarchy and the command and traditional leaders. Ostensibly share intelligence with them and to give them the responsibility of giving information and intelligence to the police whenever the need arises and more than ever before have a full grip of the traditional culture of mores and the tradition of the area and control of the youths and criminal activities by networking with the police. Generally sir, how can the country overcome its security challenges? First, there must be a reorientation of the psyche of all Nigerians to know that it's a citizen's obligation and responsibility and the need for every Nigerian to be protected and report the conduct of any unscrupulous elements to the security agencies and law to the Nigerian police. So every citizen must know that he owes the responsibility to the state to maintain law and order and to report unscrupulous elements. That is one. Two, terrorism has attained a global phenomenon now that is a cause for worry for everybody. I've already said every institution, both educational, both economic, political, must begin to invest on security apparatus. And I've said a must buy is the inspection mirror, body scanners, and what we call portable jammers. If every institution has a jammer, the, the jammer is what curbs the deterioration by use of uh, the phone. If there's a jamming machine around, it will jam it off. Because you press a number and press and as it go, it will not go. Every institution must have a jammer, scanning metal and instrumentation, which we call inspection mirror. That's one. Every institution cut across political, socioeconomic, and um, tertiary institutions must have. Two, there must be an orientation process in every institution across the country. What I mean by orientation process, in the primary school, we taught how to remain on the floor in case of explosion, how to observe the timing of 20 minutes after one explosion, and instead of running to see 
should keep calm and remain there. There should be orientation towards giving information, sharing intelligence, seeing something and saying something. It's a task that must be done by every Nigerian across the board. Then every every institution, whether public service institution like the Federal Secretariat, must more than ever before open exit points, emergency exit routes. Not that everybody doing emergency will be running towards one direction, it leads to a lot of carnage. So there must be exit points and everywhere as it were. And every institution must have fire extinguishers in every floor of their offices. Extinguishers must be ready for use. So these are the issues that are germane to control of the carnage of terrorism. We all must have our hands on deck and be able to report idle and disorderly persons moving around. If you see foreigners whom you suspect, draw the attention of the immigration, draw the attention of the police. Our borders that are porous must be covered up so that the, uh, the infiltrators will be given a life checkpoint to frustrate their aunt. They will not be able to come into the country at their caprices and their will. What would you consider to be your major achievement? High point, joining the vanguard to secure Plateau State and bringing lasting peace on the plateau. Investigation of the bomb blast the 1st of October, training manpower, because manpower is germane in the growth and development of an entity. Trained close to 1,000, 2,000 young men and women. I can't recall going back because I have a lot to say. I remember at the point when killings was rife in 1988 in Lagos, a gang was specialized in Pojo and four. Five, four, five, four, six, snatching. What they do is they snatch and move straight to Republic of Benin. So I was able to get all the car numbers stolen. I went alone to Republic of Benin to a court. Probably I saw all the vehicles lined up there, copied their numbers, and brought back to Nigeria, wrote an investigation report that these vehicles are there. And then I want to partner with Republic of Benin police, follow intelligence gathering to go and search for the criminals, Nigerians partnering with um, Cotonou criminals to remove cars on the cross-border criminal uh, journey. So I was able to do that. We were able to translate and transcribe the investigation report into French. And I got Interpol officers, went to the High Commission in, in um, Cotonou, gave it to him, to her. She was a lady, and I was introduced to one General Kuyami at that time, was his particular point. I was shocked that I had the addresses of all the Nigerians hibernating in Porto Novo. So we charged and were able to recover 60 vehicles and arrested and repatriated 15 criminals with all the vehicles on one road back to Nigeria. That was 1988 and it fetched me special problem. The major challenge, challenge number one, logistic backup. We want um, more logistics to be able to support the implementation of the community policing paradigm. For community policing to take its route, we must have enough vehicles at all the police stations up to the hinterland. At least every police station must have four vehicles, HELOX vehicles, serviceable, to be able to run and patrol, run around, patrol, and be able to secure the environment. Every police station must have compelable barracks to have their men within the reach so that in case of emergency, they can be easily mobilized and deployed. That's if you look at our manpower strength vis-a-vis the total paradigm as enunciated by United Nations. United Nations philosophy or paradigm is one policeman to 400 men. But what we have is not close to it at all. So there must be massive recruitment of policemen. One. Two, the profiling structure of the employment strategy to be tighter, very robust, and only the good personalities with sound mind in a sound body should be recruited. So the profiling structure will include the input from traditional rulers, input from religious leaders, input from external familyism, and input from the schools from where the policeman is finding his way to the police structure. Then training and retraining, which is a very, which is very, very germane, infused into the system. From my over three decades of experience, I think the police structure should not be left alone with government. Government alone cannot take care of it. There must be, more than ever before, the police trust fund, a dedicated trust fund where there will be input from the private sector, the banks, the oil industry, all the viable 
um, energetic cosmopolitan companies were coming to uh, bring in money into the police trust fund. I think with the trust fund dedicated, it will be able to solve the logistic needs of the police organization. Sir, so let me take you back in time. How did your journey into Nigerian police force all started? Oh well, that's a good question because I happened to be born a policeman. My father was a policeman and um, I came from the barrack structure. Where my father, my mother, we all lived in the police barracks. I became, I would say I began to know the world when I was six years in 1960. And from 1960 till my father retired in 1977, I was in the police barracks. So you can see that the police force lives in me and I live in it. I started seeing the police right from an early youth, about five years, four years, with the white men at the top. Barrack inspections, we, are fair, we, we all fall out with our parents, with their kids, and stand in front, and you are introduced, a family is introduced to the colonial master. We witnessed all those things. So right from childhood, I made up my mind that I would be a police. Because my father retired a sergeant, and I felt I should be able to do better than him. What is the major of a great son is to do better than what his father would have So that was my perception of life right from my childhood. So if you ask my colleagues who were in primary school that what is Christian say will become, will say policeman. If you ask my friends in the secondary school, I went to secondary school in Lagos, Baptist Academy from 1968 to 72. You ask my colleagues in the University of Nigeria, 75 to 79, where I made second class upper division, they say Chris says, He's going to better the lot of his father. He's going to be a policeman. And immediately I graduated from the University of Nigeria, the Faculty of Social Sciences, Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Politics. I left straight to seek policing career through NYC. I did my NYC with the police headquarters in Mina, Majesty, as a police pro tem, police public relations officer, as a copper, or writing press releases for them. And from there, I found my way to the police staff college where I underwent a one-year training structure where I became a cadet assistant superintendent and passed out as an ASP commission. But I was very happy and feel, uh, had a sense of fulfillment that my father was alive until I was the first public relations officer when he passed on. So we are both, we are both sharing intelligence and tradition of police force. I could recall that during my years in the police force growing up, and all the times I spent in training institutions to undergo retraining processes, I used this note, which he copied in 1948, and I still have the note up to today. So you see that I had been a policeman from the womb, born a policeman, grew as a policeman, and now I'm retiring outside the force. I hope I should still be able to impact in the police force my experiences in the training institution. Yes, I've been a trainer. I had an opportunity to train as uh, the officer in charge of legal, though not a lawyer, at the police academy from 1994 to 98. I still returned to the police academy in uh, 2005 to 2008 as deputy commissioner of police in the police academy. I returned to the police again, police academy, finally, I hope finally, as a deputy commandant, police academy in 2012. So I've been a trainer all through. And to, for that, I want to thank all the authorities who gave me the opportunity to impact in the lives of young, young cadet inspectors and ASPs. I think it's, it was a fulfilling career, talking to the young ones growing and impacting good police culture, philosophy, history. But is there any member of your family, probably your children, that is willing to take after you? Well, I can't say for sure, because I know I have a legal practitioner son, I have a medical doctor, I have um, a pharmacist also. I think um, it's for them to make up their minds. It's not, um, I was not compelled, neither was I cajoled. So I will not compel nor cajole any of my children. Let them make up their minds, whatever they want to. And I'll pray for them as a father, that God will prosper them. Do you have any word of advice for the youths and your serving officers, even as you retire? Youths, keep off drugs, sure. keep off drugs and other psychotropic substances. They destroy you mentally, they destroy you physically, and they destroy you. So all youths keep off. Youths must know that they owe the nation a duty to be law-abiding, to be nationalistic and patriotic, to give their best the development of a new Nigeria. When Nigeria will come, great, the giant, especially giant of Africa, not by nomenclature, but by, by philosophy, by practice, and by its uh, 
orientation. So I charge on the youth, fear God, keep his commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, honor your father and your mother, so your days belong. My colleagues, keep doing the good work, keep away from crime and criminality. Once the criminal is arrested, your career is finished, your life will be reduced, you'll be jailed. So keep off crime and be sensitive to what will promote your professional conduct, training, retraining, and then do your beat, honest beat, as a peacemaker. I think then God will reward you and promote you. No regret, I'm happy to serve my nation and to impact positively in the Nigeria police force. I have no regret. And my heart is full of joy. And God gave me the opportunity and the Inspector General of Police gave me an opportunity and the President also gave me an opportunity to do my modest contribution um, control of crime and criminality in the state of Plateau and Nigeria at large. I have no regret at all. If I'm born again, I'll be a policeman. No other thing will assuage my quest in life than to secure life and property. I think it's a godly call to do. And I'm sorry, I have to work spiritual. The book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 or thereabout says, Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. I say, Chris Olakwe is a child of God. Thank you sir, for sharing this much with crime fighters, the police, and you. And we are glad to have you on the program, sir. You're welcome. And that's all we can take on this edition of Crime Fighters, The Police and You. Thanks for watching. Crime Fighters, the number one security program on